to D&D Beyond, and it is my extreme delight to welcome to the channel, you know her as the creator of the YouTube channel, Monarchs Factory, covering mythology, Dungeons and Dragons, and so much more, or potentially as the co-author of the DM Skill supplement, Heroes and Villains of Theros, please welcome back to the channel, after the anniversary games at least, Dale Kingsville. Hello, thank you so, so much for having me. It's, it's just really nice to be here. I hope the people know as well that Amy's the best. Like, do, do you all know how lucky you are? Amy's the best. <laughs> I bring only the most unbiased observers to the channel. <laughs> but truly, it is delight. Uh, as one of my favorite people, one of the smartest, most creative, funniest people, most insightful people that I know, uh, who I have been delighted to see making quite a mark in the D&D space over the last couple of years. Uh, I cannot wait to throw some of my questions at you. And if you are watching this in chat and have some questions of your own, I am going to be going through a selection of the great ones some of y'all sent on Twitter. And then mods, as always, are going to be taking a look out for the best of those questions and passing them on uh, so that we can, you know, stump Dale with them and or just benefit from uh, the Oracle at Australia. Uh <laughs> the Oracle at Australia. That's, I mean, that's I it. <laughs> I paused partway through as I was like, I, I'm not sure where to look. You know, in Delphi? That's, quite yeah. a... <laughs> that's on me. That's on me. I should have moved. <laughs> uh, but we are thrilled to have you here. Uh, so I'm going to start out with one of my favorite topics that I love the way you talk about and cover. And of course, it is going to be well-trod territory for you. I recommend everyone watching this to go check out the many excellent videos Dale's done on this subject. But I love the way that you approach combining classic mythology and D&D DM tips. Let's say I'm running my game, I'm running my own world, and I need to build some myths that will really feel like myths. How would you recommend looking at that? All right. So, I mean, my apologies to anyone who's seen this video. I have talked about this before. Um, I think, all right, this is this is what it comes down to for me. And I keep in mind that that my basis is classical mythology. So I'm talking mostly Greek and Roman. But, you know, this seems to be true of um, of many other world mythologies. I believe <laughs> that any any pantheon, any uh, sort of cultural religious backdrop to a setting the key is to have one really good story, right? That everyone knows about, you know, and it, it comes up in lots of different places. I mean, the Bible, right? You have the one key story that everyone knows, Jesus dies on the cross, right? Even if you're not Christian, you know about that story. Uh, for Greek mythology, it's probably uh, Zeus defeating the Titans, right? That was the key story at the beginning of Greek mythology. Uh, you, you have these stories everywhere and it pops up in really good world building as well. If you look at Dragon Age, you've got this key story in Elven mythology. You've got the key story of Andraste. You know, it's, it's this, this little thing at the center that it doesn't matter all the details on the side. No one has to know all the edge stories. I think the key is just the one good story and the one good story involves uh, someone who represents authority. They're sort of in charge of stuff. Uh, you've got a character who represents uh, sort of protection. I call them harbor. So, so I let's let's put it this way. I use an acronym. Uh, I call it path. Other people actually came up with it, but it's a good idea. Um, so P stands for purpose, right? There's a character there who who represents having a purpose. They have a destiny. They have some special role that they have to fulfill. That they kind of are born to do. They they have this destiny. Um, there's a character, a authority, who's in charge of stuff. You've got a character who uh, is a traitor. There's always a traitor. That's the last one. That's the good one, right? That's the the twist in the story, the, the little knife in the back. Uh, and they don't always have to be a bad guy. I think that's an important thing to mention, right? Like like if you look at uh, at Greek mythology again, if if you want a traitor figure, it's probably Prometheus. Who humans love? Humans love Prometheus. He stole fire for humanity, <laughs> right? That's the only He's reason on he survived this long. Exactly, right? But he did betray Zeus. So he is the traitor figure. And then, of course, Harbor represents sort of this person who, who protects someone, usually, usually the purpose figure. So what you need is four figures who represent those things and just put them together in any configuration. Doesn't matter who they are, what they look like, just, just those sort of representations, those archetypes. 
you put them together, and at some point, someone's going to be betrayed. And that gives you this core story that is um, familiar in a lot of ways to a lot of people. They kind of, they get that thing. And I think that the power of this, this story to, to mythology in your world setting is that it gives your players just one thing to hold on to, and they will kind of understand a lot more of your world building from there. You know, they, they kind of understand the pantheon. They kind of understand the symbology because you've given them one story that's easy to remember. I think that's the key. I love that. That is one of my favorite of your videos is the specific path one. Uh, but I would be curious if you've, if you've got that, if you're like, all right, I've got my story. Um, you obviously can just directly share it as a piece of world building with your players. Um, but what are other ways to sort of make it feel true in the world or communicate to them what that means for the, for the world they're in? Right. I, I think it has to come through in art and culture. As much as possible, it's it's got to be this, you know, oh, here's this statue of Prometheus the Betrayer, right? Um, if you can try to, and I suppose that's something that games like Dragon Age do as well. And and I, Skyrim, you know, they they put these pieces in there that if you're curious, you can look into it. Um, and, and, you know, plays will be put on that represent these things. Stories will be written that just keep kind of reiterating that that shape that story shape is a, is a term the term that uh, terry pratchett used that i really like there are story shapes that we recognize and you want to seed those story shapes into the the art and the holidays oh holidays that's a great way to do it have holiday episodes that represent elements from that story that you made the other thing that i think uh, can be really fun is mary stewart uh, who wrote, a, she did write fantasy. She wrote, um, you know, the Merlin trilogy that were really good, the, the um, you know, Crystal Caves and stuff. But she also wrote a lot of um, mystery novels and thriller novels that tended to take place. She, she was big into Greek mythology. And so these stories would take place in, um, in different sort of Grecian landscapes and she would describe them with the language of the mythology. So I think that that's kind of a really interesting thing that you can do is while characters are traveling is try to seed in little bits of the story and say, and this was meant to take place here. You know, this, this is the mountain where such and such a thing happened. And so it kind ah, of impresses assigning the, actual geography the, to the elements of the story. Yeah, well, particularly with relation to um, Greek mythology, right, or classical mythology, that is a huge element that I suppose can differ from from fantasy somewhat. But if you think about Tolkien, all of these places, there's geographical places that have historical and mythological significance within this this sort of you know groundwork of fantasy. Um, but particularly within classical mythology, every everything that was happening with the gods and with the magic of mythology was happening in a real place. Mount Olympus was a real place. You could point to it. You could say, that's where the gods live, you know? Um, that's that's where the sun chariot is kept. If you wanted to, you could sneak up and steal it. Um, it's, you know, it really grounds it in a place of the the world of mortals and the world of magic are one and the same, uh, which which I really like. And I just think it's, um, it's a handy way of kind of impressing on your players, um, sort of re reiterating that story getting it in their head so that it's just in the background all the time. And it doesn't have to be big, you know, just a little throwaway reference as they're, as they're traveling, you know, describe something and say, and that's where so-and-so was murdered. I don't know, make it dramatic. <laughs> or you can, I guess it would be, it may, perhaps an, an example would be that you'd be like, this is the equivalent of the hill where uh, the first olive tree was planted that was the blessing of Athens. It's that hill right there with that yeah. tree. And like, Important yeah. trees are very easy to place in D and D. Yeah, absolutely. Cities you can you can give cities patron gods. That's that's huge in classical mythology, right? You know, this is this is Athens. This is the blessed place of Athena. But you can do that with your pantheon in D and D. You can say this is the city that was founded by. I need to come up with some some fake deity names <laughs> for this conversation. <laughs> Genericus <laughs> and know. his twin brother, uh, Devilus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so the titi the city was torn in half, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, I love the way that in the the introduction to the the congrats by the way on your DM Guild supplement Heroes and Villains of Theros. Uh, but I love the way much. in the introduction y'all discuss uh heroic fates. Now, applying the ideas <gasps> you of mythology read the introduction? to 
<laughs> that makes me good. really happy because I, I really liked that. I, I worked hard on that and I'm pleased that you read it. <laughs> I look, I, I, my bias is strongly in favor of anything that's mostly flavor text. I, I adore uh, the other parts as well, but I will tend to go there first. Um, but, uh, I love the point that you made of the way that myth mythology and story shapes would apply potentially to player characters, um, with the implication in that particular piece being this story probably doesn't end with happily ever after, because that's pretty rare in these uh, examples. What can we take from that as gamers? Yeah, see, I this is I took I took some notes here. Uh, someone on the Twitter said, "How would you evoke classical myth?" And I was like, "Oh no, I got to go and reread this stuff that I wrote." Uh, so <laughs> to to catch people up, there's there's kind of there's a handful of differences. I've already alluded to the differences between fantasy and classical mythology in particular. I I keep saying classical just so that people know because if you get into Nordic mythology, it's going to start being a slightly different genre again. If you get into Celtic mythology, it's a slightly different genre again. You know, it's it's all different. So I'm coming from a classical mythology base, uh, which a, a lot of a lot of Western English speaking culture does kind of have its basis in those stories so that's why that's why i keep talking about them just so that you know just so that you know um but no i've i've made a couple little notes here in my dnd notebook and I, I will say um, because i also <laughs> pasted this one in i believe that is a thanks to i was you know stealing this question in part for my own satisfaction but <laughs> i'm stalling for time as i scroll through my notes so that i can find the excellent question from Cormac O'Sullivan. Any tips for evoking epic Greek myth in a D&D &D campaign? Okay, thank you. Continue. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the notes that I've made, the big differences are uh, that the gods shouldn't be distant, which we've already talked about. It's very sort of grounded and literal. They, they should be present, right? They, they show up. They give the heroes gifts. They, you know, they're the ones kind of driving a lot of the stories. So having them be kind of, um, you know, omnipotent but invisible doesn't quite work out if you're evoking classical mythology uh heroes your, are, your are defined by this i was just gonna say your cleric and yeah. warlock will probably appreciate this choice so. yeah your your god will show up and talk to you your patron will show up and talk to you they'll say i need you to go and do this right um <laughs> i think that a, a, another significant difference is that heroes are defined by their flaws not their virtues so in uh in like fantasy we're used to this sort of chivalric Arthurian idea of like oh yes he he's very brave or he's you know very noble he's good and honest you know these sorts of things the the heroes in Greek myth it's very much like what is your flaw that will kill you that's constantly the point of the story right um but as you were just alluding to the third and I think maybe maybe one of the most important differences is that fate is unassailable it's honest that you can't you can't beat it, no matter what you do. So, if we're talking about death as a fate, there are more than one fate. You know, you can. You, there are fates worse than death. Um, <laughs> but if the fate that we're speaking about is death, right? You have heroes who do travel to the underworld and escape. They do things like that. But ultimately, the story will always come back around to to whatever that fate is. If you, if you have a prophecy and you try to avoid it, it's going to come true. I mean, ask Oedipus, ask anyone. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, if you if you think of Orpheus, who traveled to the underworld, something that no one's ever done. Wait for me. Um, something that no one's ever done. <laughs> he travels to the underworld and he makes it back. But the goal was to get Eurydice out. And she doesn't make it. You know, um, if you have, oh, uh, Sisyphus, you know, he escaped death twice. He just kept doing it. He was so successful. And guess what? Now he is not only in the underworld, but he is pushing a rock up a hill forever. So there's this kind of underlying expectation of tragedy. Not every Greek story uh, was tragic, but it was kind of this, um, this reversal of fortune from being a hero who is beloved to being, you know, brought down by your own flaws <laughs> is, uh, is so key to classical mythology. And it's something that is quite different from, from you know, your, your standard high fantasy D and D game because you expect there to be things like resurrection spells. And I don't think that you necessarily have to 
say if if you wanted to evoke classical myth in a D and D game, I don't think you have to say, "Oh, there's no such thing as resurrection spells." That's a very easy way to do it. I mean, try it if you're into it and your players are down. But I think that there are ways to make fate sadder than that. <laughs> you know, you you do successfully get brought back to life, but something else. You know, and Theros yeah. is a really interesting setting for that because I mean, I'm a I'm a big, I, I love, I love Theros. It's it's my favorite MTG set, no surprise. Um, I have like a thousand cards over there. Um, but in Theros as a setting, you have the concept of the returned, right? Who they can come back from the underworld, but in order to do it, they have to um, destroy their funerary masks. That, that that's the thing that lets them hold on to their identity. So in order to come back, there has to be something important enough that they want to come back. But they have to completely lose their identity in the process, their memory. They don't know who they are. So they come back and they got nothing. And that's so tragic. That is so good for classical myth. <laughs> Just make it sadder. Make it sadder than death. Resurrection is fine as long as you can make it sad. <laughs> <laughs> How would you, as a DM approach, sort of, would you work out those fates in tandem with a player? Like, or would you prefer as a player to be sort of like, I'm just like choosing to have the DM choose that fate for you and just find out? Like, how? what would be the advantages or disadvantages of different ways of putting that in practice? Right. I mean, ugh, communication is always key, isn't it? It's the hardest thing. It's so hard to just talk to people with honesty <laughs> and openness, but it's also like, really important because if you There's ask no a player yeah hey yeah exactly if you are if you talk to the player and you say hey this is this is the kind of thing that i'm trying to evoke right now <laughs> you know tragedy <laughs> um but you want to keep playing this this character so i want to talk to you about how we're going to handle you know this resurrection um and they might say you know what surprise me and they'll have a blast with that. But other ones might say, okay, well, I don't want this. I do want that. And it's it's literally just having a conversation. Ow, I hit my hand. Um, it's literally just having a conversation, <laughs> you know, um, which it, it's scary. It's scary, but you got to do it. You really got to do it. I no other love way. that so much. Ooh, and uh, I'm just, just because it happened to come in right as a piggyback here. Mick18599 says, what about player agency versus fate? Is that something you would just want to like communicate out first? Are we playing in a avert your fate game or a this will be fun to see how I can circumvent it? What would you recommend? Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to depend on the table. It's going to depend on the table. But I think I, I believe that there is no fun lost in the act of um, plotting out fate. Particularly if you're talking about um, about Greek tragedy, so many of those, or even if you get into Shakespearean tragedy, a lot of the time, you know how it's going to end. You know how it's going to end. You know, it tells you, hey, Perseus is going to kill his granddad. That's how the story starts. And you you go through the whole story just kind of finding out how you're going to get there. And the great thing about classical mythology is that it's really easy for it to be a very silly twist of fate, right? So Perseus. It, the, well, technically Perseus, his grandfather spends the whole story avoiding this fate, right? It puts him in a box and sends him out to sea. And all this adventure happens and it's all completely unrelated. And then at the very end of the story, Perseus goes to compete in some games, some funeral games, and he throws a frisbee and he hits his granddad in the foot and his granddad dies. Like it's, it's, it's so, I mean, I don't recommend that you in your D&D &D game have the twist be death by frisbee. Okay, I can't recommend that. I feel like that's that. something I the don't... dice would deliver. You know what I mean? I feel it's like that true. is the kind of twist of fate the dice might just hand you at some point. <laughs> like, yeah, it's like, well, uh, you rolled in that check. one, so yeah, your granddad died by frisbee. <laughs> it's not my fault. The <laughs> dice said so. Um, yeah, but you know, that's it's it, that's the thing is that you can wait for that opportune moment. Let them let them avoid fate all they like, but find that moment. Find that moment for it to come true. Um, or alternatively, just, you know, when you, when you can sense it coming up in the story, if you think, oh, Perseus has gone back to his granddad's city. So this is going to be our opportunity. Pull Perseus's player aside and say, Hey, let's plot out a really tragic, like end to this that matches the, the prophecy that matches your fate. But, you know, 
we won't tell the other players, something like that. That can be really, really fun is just pulling one person in on it. So you can still have the surprise factor, but you know, they get to feel like they were part of the plotting. I love doing things like that, where it's just like you, you get to be a DM with me for a minute. Uh, and we're going to make this special thing for the other players to enjoy. And then they get to enjoy it as well, because that's that's the enjoyment that a DM experiences, right? You plot out this stuff and you see it unfold and it makes you happy. So so the player being in on the secret doesn't take away from their enjoyment of it, in my experience. I love that. That's a great answer. All right, let's see. We we have some great questions coming in already. First off, we have a, a very important d d Beyond question um, that it is uh, urgent for us to know. What is your favorite dinosaur? <gasps> Stegosaurus. I'm so glad you asked me that question. I'm <laughs> I'm always ready to answer. Stegosaurus. I feel like there is no animal on earth that is reminiscent of a Stegosaurus. Not really. You know, we got lizards, we got we got all these things, we got bats, whatever. But we do not have, we are rhinos. I think rhinos are similar to Triceratopses in some ways. But Stegosaurus, it's like, man, I got all these plates on my spine. And I got a spiky tail. Love them. <laughs> One of a kind. There's a photo somewhere. <laughs> yeah, there's a photo somewhere of me with uh, Mia Rosella and Omar Najam. And I'm <laughs> I'm seeing a stegosaurus skeleton in person for the first time. And I'm crying. <laughs> it's out there. It's in the world. I love that. If anyone has a place, tweet it at me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's see. Okay, this is... I'm, well, I'm going to skip around a little bit. And then we're going to get back on some of our, our big topics. Question from Armand Aaron Lore. Uh, what Aussie food would you include in D&D? I don't know why food is in quotes here. Uh, like fairy bread or sausage sizzle? I mean, any, any and all, right? So, I mean, oh, okay. Sausage sizzle feels like it's it sort of slots in very seamlessly with the sort of um, British food sausage base that you expect sizzle in fantasy. Sausage sizzle slots in seamlessly? What are you doing to me? <laughs> I did it on purpose. I did it. It's a new tongue twister. Uh, everyone should try it. It's the hottest. It's the hottest new thing. It's all the rage. Um, oh, fairy bread. These are all good answers. Pavlova is my favorite. Ooh, what's that? Do you do you all have pavlova? You don't have pavlova? Oh, it's delicious. Okay, it's it, what it is is egg whites and sugar whipped until they form like uh, soft peaks, and then you bake them. But the outside gets crispy and the inside gets like gooey and chewy and sticky. And then you put cream on top, like whipped cream and all these fruits. So it's just like passion fruit, strawberry, raspberries, blueberries. And it's just, and you eat it with a little, a little bit of ice cream, maybe some custard. It's incredible. It's, it's my favorite. It's my favorite dessert. Uh, <laughs> so pavlova, I think, would be very important to me. I love that. Uh, let's see. I love, okay, not a question, but a, another of our mods. Just want to tell Dale that I played a Forgotten God Warlock uh, as a noble from Satessa and loved every second of it. Uh, their Forgotten God was, this is from Not a Halfwing, uh, my Forgotten God was just the old harvest myth of Karametra. These communities offer abundant sacrifices to the god. The noble family secretly practiced this sacrifice to Karametra, so she would spill her own blood to gain spell slots and eldritch smite with her bow. My favorite flavor of any character I've ever had. Thank you for an incredible resource. That makes me so happy. That makes me that I I'm, I've got tingles. I've got tingles. I'm so happy right now. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> this is this is it. This is it makes it worthwhile. <laughs> uh, a cup of squids is in with what would you say is the one most important thing a first time world builder to, uh, should do or not do when building their own mythology? Oh, I mean, it's tough because I think when it comes to world building, some people are just like, that's how they have fun, right? I, I would think it's very important, particularly if you're DMing games to figure out what it is that makes the game super fun to play for you. Because I think it's easy to forget that um, that the DM is playing, right? You're not just running the game. You are, you are a player. You're, you're meant to have fun. You're meant to, it's a game. Um, and so you have to figure out what it is that makes it fun for you and chase that. And if you are a world building DM, then this next bit of advice is going to be rubbish and you should ignore me. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I think if, if there's something that people should avoid, it's, um, getting too bogged down in the details and trying to do too much at once. Um, 
I think it's, I mean, I I have a lot of fun just sort of laying out a general sort of map and going, here's a vague idea of what's going on, right? Here's a, a, a sort of shadow of what the story is like. And here's the core bit that I talked about earlier, right? The 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 four archetypes, the, the path archetypes. Um, I think that that's the only part that you really need to nail down. And then the rest can be little sprinkles that you throw in here and there because your players aren't going to be devouring so much lore at one time that you can't prepare for it later on, as far as my experience goes. But if you are someone who just loves that stuff, you love coming up with all the myths, you're like, okay, well, I've got my, I've got my four archetypal path gods. But at this point, I really want to figure out some demigod heroes. And you want to make your your little extra stories on the side. Oh, and then at this point in time, this happened. You end up with a whole timeline of mythology. If that's, if that's what you like, then do it, right? Chase the white rabbit is what I always end up saying is, is I can give you all the advice, but it's all going to be tailored to me and my experience of play in the game. Um, whereas, you know, you, you, got, you got to do what you like. Do what you have fun with. Take what you like and put it in your game. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic advice. Uh, thank you so much. This, uh, Please feel free to keep sending questions because we have so much more to talk about. But thank you, Dale Kingsmill, for those incredible insights. Uh, and please do check out Monarch's Factory for some of the breakdowns of what we've just been talking about and much, much more. Still, still, still.